UFP, the United Federation of Podcasts. Welcome to Franchise Fatigue, the little podcast on the United Federation of Podcast Network talking about films and sequels and remakes and how we love them. And we just love to gobble them up because they're so much fun and there's nothing better and nothing more warm and cuddly than a day on the beach. And joining me for some sunshine is my good friend, Zach Moore. Zach Moore, come with me. Let's go on our little raft. Let's go on our little sailboat and have a wonderful day. Just when you thought it was safe to go back into the podcast. There you go. I said it. It's a tagline from Jaws 2, one of the most famous taglines of movie history. I agree. And I, I you know what? I think that's a great poster. I love the poster for Jaws 2. I love the poster for Jaws 1. I love the poster for Jaws 3 and Jaws Friend. You know what? All four of these movies have great posters. <laughs> I'm just going to say all four of them have great posters. Well, Brandon, you can't judge a movie by its poster. We'll put it that way. Uh, No, definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, we have got ourselves another wonderful guest joining us to continue the conversation because he just did not have enough the first time. Ken Tripp, you are here for some more punishment. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Brandon. Thanks again, guys, for having me aboard this, um, you know, the, the tagline, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water was actually very impactful. Um, we all know who did the voice, right? For the trailer for Jaws and Jaws 2. Commodore Stone. Star Trek alumni. That's right, baby. Um, Percy Rodriguez. He, he was Percy Rodriguez. Very, very deep voice. Uh, but a lot of people were just starting to crawl back into the water and get back to the beaches after the terrifying impact Jaws had a lot of people. So I'll never forget those commercials. They scared me more than I can tell you when I was a kid. It's, it is one of those things where it's like it's become it's been parodied so much and copied so much and ripped off so much it's kind of lost its effectiveness but hence my unenthusiastic <laughs> reading of it off the top but no to your point there's a reason it's so iconic and there's a reason people keep going back to it because of it's such a it's such a what a, what a great tagline for a sequel to jaws and that voice you know especially at the very end was the all new jaws 2 it's ah <laughs> <laughs> i love it yes and uh, I don't know. I think they missed an opportunity when they didn't call it Jaws Two, Jaws Harder. <laughs> That's uh, for, okay. See, see, Die Hard Two, it's not called Die Harder, and X Men Two is not called X Men United. These are much like just when you thought it was safe to go back to the water. Die Harder was a tagline, and X Men United was a tagline. These are not part of the titles, but for some reason, over time and home video releases, it's become part of the title. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Well. What about answer the call? That that that's a whole. Other, I'm not going to touch that can of worms right now, <laughs> until maybe next year we talk about Ghostbusters spoilers for next year. <laughs> so, Jaws two. <laughs> this time it's personal. No, that's Jaws of Revenge. But let's get into some of the trivia here. <laughs> um, this picture uh, it was briefly, very briefly, the highest grossing sequel in history until Rocky two came out the next year. Because uh, this film was released in 1978, Rocky II came out in 1979, Jaws 2 coming three years after the original Jaws. Uh, it was originally going to be rated R, but they decreased the body count, uh, again, to give that PG rating because they were kind of two in the line between those two ratings. Now, a lot of people, you know, we talked about it a lot, the tagline there, just when you thought it was safe to go back into water, Andrew J. Kewitt, who developed the first film's trailer, is credited with coming up with that phrase. Of course, a lot of people take credit for that, but... Uh, the trivia I found gave him credit for it. And uh, Spielberg and Dreyfus, they were approached to return in the sequel, but uh, they were on to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and uh, production on that was running behind, so they declined to participate. And uh, Spielberg, Spielberg had some you know, uh, conflicting quotes about coming back for Jaws. Uh, he had said that, quote, making a sequel to anything is just a cheap, carny trick. But then he went on to say that uh, if he hadn't had such a, a horrible experience on the sea directing the first film, that he would have come back for the sequel. Now, 
Uh, there is a lot of directorial drama about the behind the scenes making this movie. So we will we will put a pin in that and come back around to it because Ken Tripp, our Jaws expert, has a lot of detailed knowledge about that. But we eventually ended up with Geno Swark. There were a lot of false starts and stuff before that. Geno Swark, I know best from directing Supergirl, the movie, <laughs> a couple years after this. And he also directed right. Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour, kind of a, a fantasy romance time travel story. Uh, and he actually went on to be a television director, directed a lot of episodes of Smallville. Really? And that's true. Many episodes of Smallville were directed by Geno Swark. Uh, but him and uh, Schneider, uh, him and Rob Schneider did not, Rob Schneider, I call him Rob Schneider again. Him and Roy Schneider did not get along <laughs> very well. <laughs> the Manimal in Jaws. <laughs> you can like do it. Is he like this in Standard oh, Orbit? <laughs> Ken, is he like this in Standard Orbit? <laughs> No, I, I'm more like him on standard over yeah. <laughs> Very good. I'm the one who screws it up on standard over <laughs> William Shitner. <laughs> William Shitner. <laughs> so uh, Roy Schneider, he didn't want to be in Jaws 2, but he had recently left the production of The Deer Hunter, uh, which led to some conflicts with Universal because he had a multi-film contract with them. Now, Universal agreed to forgive him leaving the Deer Hunter if he did Jaws 2, which they would count as the two remaining films of a contract because they had two films left. They said, look, if you do Jaws 2, we'll be even. So he agreed to do it, but he frequently clashed with General Swark. And he was also paid $400,000 to reprise his role, which is four times what he got for the original Jaws. So even though he didn't have the greatest time doing it, didn't want to do it, he got paid very well in 1978 money. They just they just, just clashed up the whole the whole production, and one of the producers had to sit them down and have them air their differences. But it resulted in a physical confrontation <laughs> between the two of them. So there was drama on the first Jaws. There's drama on this Jaws. This franchise is just just cursed, much like the uh, the Brody family is cursed by these sharks. Uh, this franchise is cursed <laughs> with behind the scenes uh, drama. John Williams did return to do the music. For this film, but delays in shooting meant that he was uh, forced to start working on the score before the film was completed, which is uh, not standard procedure. And this will tie into some of the trivia that Kim will uh, fill us in on some of the drama about why they kind of changed the plot of Jaws 2 after they started production. But many residents of Martha's Vineyard, uh, they did not want to make their town look like it was closed and run down and, and dilapidated from the events of the first Jaws. That was kind of the first idea. They wanted to have boards over the windows about a businesses that had to shut down due to all the shark drama. And only one drugstore allowed its windows to be boarded up for the moody look that the original director, Johnny Hancock, wanted to do. And th there was a movement to get Jaws out of the town. It was like a blessing and a curse being popular. So there was universal go-home T-shirts that were being sold. And, the you know, the, a lot of people just wanted them out of there because they were just disrupting their way of life up there. That being said, uh, lots of lots of changes were made and we got the sequel you got, but we'll wrap back around to that in a second. The first film, as we talked about, what you don't see is scarier than what you do see. And it was all built on suspense. But General Swark thought, hey, look, we've already seen the shark. Let's just get right to it. You can't put that toothpaste back in the bottle, right? We all know what the shark is. We know what it looks like. We've seen it operate. So he didn't really, he wasn't concerned with like that Hitchcock suspense level that Spielberg was in the first Jaws. So we see the, the shark right off the top. We see it a lot in this one. We see it a lot more than in the first Jaws. I don't have a number count in minutes, but it's a lot, lot more than the first Jaws. Uh, but interestingly enough, you'd never see the tail of the shark in this film, you see the dorsal fin, but you never see the tail, which which you would see in a lot of shots. And for I'm not, I'm not sure if that was a production problem or a creative choice or what, but you only see that iconic dorsal fin of the shark. And uh, a cool tie-in to the first movie is uh, the flower planter on the Brody's porch. It's bright yellow, and it's apparently one of the barrels from the first Jaws. Like, I don't know if that's supposed to be an in-joke like in the production or in, in universe, so to speak, that's actually supposed to be one of the barrels. I mean, that'd be kind of cool because we saw Brody and Hooper paddling back to shore with those barrels at the end of the first film. Now, uh, Richard Dreyfuss' character, he was supposed to go off on the uh, Aurora expedition, uh, Hooper, in the first in the first movie, and that's the excuse that they used for him to be in this movie when he got the phone call that says, hey, I'm doing uh, Close Encounters with Steven Spielberg instead, so I'm not going to be in your movie. Uh, so that there actually was a seed for that explanation in the first film. Very lame way to write a character out, but, you know, it did track. And Mark Gilpin, who played Sean Brody, uh, according to him, uh, when they were shooting one of the scenes uh, with all the rafts that were kind of stuck together in the yachts, they were circled by a real hammerhead shark out there in the water. 
And when the actors began to like yell and scream and holler to the production crew to draw their attention to it, they thought they like, oh, hey, great. They thought, they thought they were just being in character and they gave them a thumbs up. That would be great. Totally. I could just see that scene just like that. That's exactly what I want to see for you guys. <laughs> That's so believable. Man, these kids are really into it. Let me tell you, they, they question all the kid actors, but... Uh... Near the end of the film, uh, the character of Marge, who was the girl who was with Sean Brody, her and the helicopter pilot were supposed to survive. The helicopter pilot was supposed to be able to breathe due to an air bubble in his cockpit, and uh, Marge was supposed to avoid the shark by diving underwater, uh, where they decided just to kill them off anyway, to add a couple more deaths to the death count. And that's part of the problem with this movie. There's just so many characters. I didn't know that character's name until I <laughs> was reading the trivia Marge. I'm like, okay. This film, much like the first Jaws, where the... Uh, Explosion of the shark was filmed last on the last day of shooting. The uh, The final sequence of this film to be filmed was the shark being electrocuted on the cable. This actually was the inspiration for the Jaws the Ride in Universal Studios, uh, the the second iteration of the ride. In the first iteration of the ride, there's a whole mythology about the Jaws the Ride at Universal Studios Florida. I highly recommend you guys look it up. If you want a cool video about it, uh, Defunct Land is a great YouTube channel that talks about theme park rides. I'm all about that stuff, so I love it. Uh, it goes into detail about the original Jaws ride and how there was, uh, much like the Jaws film itself, the sharks didn't work and there were all these mistakes and a guy fell into the water and they sued and, and all the mechanics didn't work because they didn't design the sharks right. Lots of great stuff about the Jaws ride. but So they shut down that Jaws ride because it had the original ending where the, where the shark blows up. That was the end of the first iteration of that ride. So then when they changed it for the, the Mark II version of that ride, it was the end of Jaws 2 where the shark gets electrocuted and then the animatronic of the shark comes up. It's all burned like it is in this movie. I actually got to ride that ride before they tore it all down and built Harry Potter land. But, uh, you know, there you have it. Uh, and then finally, last bit of trivia here. Robert Shaw, a few months before his death, he had the chance to see the movie on a private pass. And his reaction was, I'm glad I did not intervene in this piece of blank. So that were... <laughs> That was his thoughts on Jaws 2, and there you have it. So that's my bit of trivia. Ken, let me let me toss it over to you, because I know you have a deep, intricate knowledge of the production of Jaws 2, and you kind of fill in some blanks about all this original story intention and the director change and things of that nature. I know you're way more qualified than me to speak to it. Well, yeah, sure. Thanks, Zach. So originally, um, when they uh, with the success of Jaws, obviously uh, Richard Zanuck and Brown, um, I forget his first name, uh, Wanted to obviously uh, make make a sequel, and they they had Howard Sackler. He was the other person that claimed to co wrote co who co wrote some of the words used in the Indianapolis speech in the first movie. So that was the other writer. I couldn't remember his name at the time. So Howard Sackler and Dorothy Tristan collaborated to to write the script, and Dorothy Tristan was married to John Hancock. So that worked out. Uh, who was the hired director for the film, and. The original premise of the movie was exactly as you said, Zach, where, you know, um, Amity is really hit with hard times and they're, they're trying to put the pieces back together. And as things start to get better, well, they have another shark problem. The script, you know, incorporated some of the elements that you see in what was filmed in Jaws 2, but they decided to scrap everything. Um, you were right that there was a, a fair amount of people on Martha's Vineyard that, that weren't too excited about bringing back Universal, but it's a little overstated. Um, the plan was to film most of, not all of it, down in Pensacola, Florida, which is where most of it was filmed. In the scenes where you see um, Brody, uh, after he's fired, chasing the ambulance, um, that scene uh, where you first see the shark in Edgartown Harbor, uh, they only brought the mechanical shark up for that one shot, and it was towed by a boat. Uh, you know that little, sh you know, it comes up by between some sailboats or mm -hmm. whatever. This yeah. is while they're they're at the Holiday Inn doing their their little dance there. Um, but if you if you pay attention closely when Brody's following the ambulance uh, when they're when they're trying to rescue these folks from the um, from the lobster uh, the lobster hunt or whatnot, you can kind of see that the uh, the town is boarded up. Because <laughs> they kept that scene, so if if you if you pay attention, you can see it's kind of dark and muted. It has a different feel than the rest of the film, which is much brighter. And that's what Hancock was was really trying to do was to create this atmosphere. In fact, it was a pretty sunny day uh, that they were filming that scene, and he had the uh, local fire department spray everything with water so that everything looked a little damp, had a different feel to it. 
um, so forth and so on. So you, you kind of capture in that one 